I'll talk about the, our research on liver region and the temporal over the embedding to understand the evolution of the cyber threats. This is a joint work with Gianluca, and this is his Twitter handle. It's pretty short. Write it down. Anyway, so for the outline of the talk, it's pretty straightforward. I will cover four parts, the motivation, the core idea, due to time and restraint, I will only cover some evaluation routes, and I will focus on the limitations, what we didn't do well, what would be the shortage, I mean, basically the shortcoming of this method. So that will be transparent and foster some discussions. So the summary of our research is that the goal is pretty straightforward. We try to understand how the exploration of the vulnerabilities evolve over the time as part of the multiple step attack. At the same time, we're hoping to provide insights into how the attackers operate. At the same time, offer human analysis a new perspective when analyzing the IDS alerts. Talking about the motivations, let's start with the example regarding the CVE 2018 7602. It's about the Drupal remote code execution. Suppose we have the ground truth, we will be able to get the script or the binary from the attackers. We get everything extracted, we can actually see a brown check like this. You will probably see forward to observe that is a recon phase scanning branch. You attacking different content management systems and trying to exploit. Over the time, we get another ground truth, we get another script from the same attacker group, we extract another branch, you will see that the same vulnerability will be leveraged in a different context, this more surrounding this Drupal ecosystem. By exploiting the PHP, then the SQL injection, and the last one is special because a lot of people are talking about migrating the code fusion to Drupal. So that's why they're just trying to do this kind of exploit. If you piece everything together and you go back to the tenement tree, voila, you got it. You will actually see how the thing is reflected in the tenement tree. You can understand the operations. You will be able to tell that how many endpoints being exploited. The challenge is pretty straightforward. We don't have the ground truth. And for the tenement tree level, Yes, if you want to study how the vulnerability being exploited, that's where you highlight it. The rest of the things just remain in the darkness. To make things even worse, the challenges, there are two challenges. The first thing is that we don't have obvious event relationships when we're actually looking at the, the telemetry data. And the context of a security event and its relationship may drift. Is that at a certain time, there may be two different attack branches will be used together, and there's a transition period. Maybe the attackers are looking for how to use this exploit more effectively, more efficiently. So there's a transition period, and make you look at the telemetry, you will get confused. What we can do, we can actually look at the telemetry data. Here's our observation. So the left-hand side is attack. That is something that we won't be able to get from the point of view of ground truth. And in the middle, you got the IPS system for protecting the customers. And towards the right-hand side, you will have the telemetry data. That's what we get. From that point on, usually we will leverage the time series based on the frequencies. So for example, for the same exploit, we can actually plot how this exploit being used in the wild. It is useful, I have to admit this one is very useful, but it is not the exploit in an isolated way. You will see that the time series of the frequencies, that's all you get, but how these attacks are used as a part of the complex cyber attacks, you won't get that from this picture. Moreover, when we put multiple time series together, 
For example, this one you will see actually four exploits relating to the web servers. We put them together, trying to understand how these exploits are used in the wild. So we have a big picture how the web servers are exploited. It's pretty difficult to compare the time series, especially when you see the Apache suits exploit is out there and dominating the rest of the time series. Unless you zoom in, even you zoom in like in the internet, you probably won't be able to observe much information. Our core idea is pretty straightforward. We will see the action from the attackers. It is not observable. Again, I have to stress on this point. And then we have the IPS system. And we will actually see the reflection of attackers' action. So that's the very key observation for us. To make things simple, we think that per security event, we treat it as a word. Per endpoint telemetry data, we treat it as a sentence. Putting them together, we have millions of endpoints, and you treat the attackers that are writing their histories in the endpoints, you have the documents, you have the authors. So we can actually leverage, possibly, natural language processing techniques to do some processing and understand if it is possible to leverage these techniques to understand how these security events actually evolve over the time. One thing we have to deal with is the laws. Is that because of the concurrency and also the system recording the security events, the order may not be preserved. That is something that we need to bear in mind. So we propose a symmetric context window surrounding the event that's supposed to investigate to deal with the noise incurred by concurrency. So that is the context window you center around E11. You will be able to capture the security events that may co occur at the same time with this security event. From there, we will be able to get the co-occurrence tuples or the security events that are surrounding, let's say, event 11. We'll be able to get all these tuples out. Move on. From the co-occurrence tuples, we leverage the positive point-wise mutual information. Basically, these three equations there to generate the PPMI matrix. So we'll be able to generate how the security events co-occur with the others. So we can actually quantify the likelihood to security events co-occur in the context window. Furthermore, we will be able to actually do the matrix factorization to get a dense representation about the, each security events. Note that this is a d-dimensional vector and the d is way smaller than the number of security events that you are investigating. So you have a dense vector. So we'll be able to further reduce the noise and capture the events with high order occurrence. The high order occurrence is meaning the security events appear in similar contexts. It don't necessarily need to be the exact context, just similar context. From the methodology perspective, of course, it is just one timestamp. Since we're gonna understand how the things evolve, we have to deal with the temporal changes. So from per timestamp, dense vector space, we've actually used this equation here to consider all the embeddings across the whole observation period, and we'll be able to optimize how the things are embedded in the vector space. So the advantage is that, since I've already mentioned the vector space, we've already transformed the event IDs into, let's say, d-dimensional space. From there, we have fast and good algorithms to evaluate this vector data. So what we can do will be limited by our imagination, since the vectors, that's what we'll be able to operate. From architecture perspective, 
I've already talked about the upstream method. Basically, we convert the raw data into temporary embeddings per security event. And then I will move on to talk about the downstream analysis tasks. There are actually three of them, change detection, trend identification, and the evolution evaluation, basically how the context change. For the point of view of data set, we use the anonymized security event data connected from the semantic intrusion prevention system. In the data we connected, it contains around 8,100 unique event IDs. From there per day, we get about 190 million security events per day from millions of endpoints. We connected 102 days data between 2016 and 2018. Note that we do this just for, to understand from a long-term perspective how the vulnerabilities evolve. From the practical perspective, you don't necessarily need to go through the two years. You can actually just say half a year, you will be able to observe a short-term evolution. So the first for the change detection, we talk about how we can actually identify the changes per security event change. So this one is a PHP MyAdmin RFI CVE. You'll be able to see that before the CVE was disclosed, the embedding is pretty stable. That means our method is working because the context doesn't exist. So it's supposed to be stable. After that, you can see that our similarity actually changed. You will see a swift diversion from the long existing context means there will be some context there. So that's the difference. That's where you see where the drift happens. At the same time, there is a gap between where the context starting drafting to the disclosure date. This one has already been documented by a paper in NDS 2015. So we will also be able to capture that kind of small difference here. The second analysis task is trend identification. So to the left-hand side, that's a frequency-based time series analysis. You will see a spike and probably another second spike over the time. And the attack vector will be able to leverage the vector norms to identify the securities even usage in a more meaningful way. You will see the spike from here up there. You will be actually cor corresponding to the spike here. And the usage will be reasonably stabilized because Apache Suits has been a very popular attack vector. Comparing to the time series, this one is more stable and show you the trend, how it is used. So this stable trend, ignoring all the velocity from the frequency side. Another example is regarding when you're trying to compare different security events, how they actually been trend, I mean, how they actually used in different trend, even they are actually at different magnitude. To the, to the left hand side, you will see that the inlet, that's where you can actually zoom in. You still see the spike. You cannot tell whether or not the green line is still used or not. So to the right hand side, the attack to better will be to enhance based upon the usage and show you a more meaningful trend. So security analysis can see that the green line is still being used. Okay, so for the last one is about the event evolution. So that's back to the very beginning of this example. When you see actually two campaigns, like for example, for the first campaign is a recon, com, recon attack, right? And gradually migrated over the time, it is more targeting to the tuple itself. So that's both two branches, suppose we have them. So in the middle, you will see the figure that we capture such kind of drift from the beginning to the end. So basically, the blue lines are the top three associated attack vectors with Drupal. And the red lines are the top three 
attack vectors associated with Zupo towards the end of the observation period. So from there, we can actually see a clear trend that gradually the attackers, they just migrate the, the Zupo RCE CVE from a part of the recon phase into a more targeted attack. Because you can see the similarities, the red lines keep on going up and the blue lines is clearly dropping over the time. Okay, I will spend a couple minutes on the limitations, what we didn't do well regarding this method, just for transparency. So for this one, you will see that the frequency-based time series and all these attack vectors from the point of view of telemetry, it drops almost to zero. What was reflected in the attack vector is a drop of the trend the trend values, the vector norm itself. It is not ideal. So that's the part that is not ideal for this method to be sensitive to such change. However, the good part is that the, the trend is not dropping to zero comparing to the frequency part. And it will recover quite quickly once we get the telemetry data back. So that's the, the part that we didn't do well. So it is a, sensitive to a case when the telemetry, I mean, basically the security even dropped to almost zero. So that's part we didn't do well. The second part of the limitation is that our method is data driven. So it cannot deduce any insights before the event was detected. So it can only tell you how the threats actually changed once you know the security event, you know the signature, then you will be able to see how it is changed. And the last part is for our evaluation method. It's self-referential. So basically, if you look at all the analysis tasks, it's based on the assumption that this method is correct. So that's something that we didn't do well. However, the, one of the things that we can do to quantify if this method is correct or not will be based on the assumption we get at the ground truth. So for example, if you get the attack, let's say the script from the attackers, and you will be able to extract the multiple attacks, then you can go back to the telemetry level, hold out the attack, part of the attack as ground truth, and predict if I given this security event where I'm looking for, I'm able to predict the context based upon the ground truth we extracted from this script. So that's one of the things we can do, but we didn't do that in the paper. So to this point, I will conclude my talk and open the floor for questions. All right, any questions? Hi, lovely. Um, I have a question. I'm very interested in the sort of co-occurrence of events, and you had a very nice story on slide, I think, 39. Uh, I just was wondering how common stories that make sense in exploitation events that happen in the same window, uh, how, how, how frequent it is that it makes sense. That's a good question. I mean, to quantify mm -hmm. if the observation makes sense or not, will be depending on if you have the ground truth. Especially if you don't have the ground truth, then what you can do is to induce from the data. I have to stress that the, this method is purely data driven. So we can actually see if a given security event can, I mean, the context surrounding it drift or not over the time. So from that point, we, we will be able to see if the context, based on the context window size, you will be able to see the context really change or not, right? Yeah. But I mean, as, 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 you, as I said, I mean, unless you have the ground truth to verify this observation, it stays as a data-driven perspective. Can I? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, yes. Uh, but I mean, on, on, on that, you had a very nice story, right? It showed the attacker arrives with uh, like reconnaissance and then it has a privilege escalation that runs some code and then quits, something like that. And this ha was a story that was clearly showing that the attacker had a purpose and was sort of doing something meaningful to reach a target that 
without that story wouldn't get there. Uh, but do you also have evidence of like attacks that don't make any sense altogether? As in, it's always the same kind of attack. So I launch all remote code execution exploits that I have because they're all embedded in my exploit kit and then it's just a stupid attack and throws all the time 12 attacks that are identical and it's just the attacker being sloppy. That's what I meant by story that makes sense. It, it is possible. I mean, if you look at the, the security attacks, they'll be done by amateurs, they'll be done by professionals. Amateurs they may actually just, like, let's take the exploit and just run a script. It always stays like that. Right. Can we chat after maybe? For yeah, lunch? I mean, we can actually have a awesome. chat after that. Yeah. Sounds good. Let's thank you in one last time.